now probably close enough to get this thing started. Um, I don't think any other people are filing in. If they do, then they'll just lose out on the brilliant introduction that I'm about to do. And I've <laughs> I have five minutes left, apparently, according to our, uh, our organizer. All right, so um, hello. My name is Rusty Klophouse. Uh, today I'm going to talk to you about REAC, uh, basically REAC small to large. Um, I'm going to do this talk in three parts. Uh, the first talk is just going to be a quick introduction uh, to sort of REAC and the reason why it was built and what it's, what it's designed for. Um, the next part is going to be discussing REAC at scale. Uh, there I'm going to go through uh, sort of the characteristics that are important uh, to, to sort of developers and to your, uh, to your uh, sys sysops people at uh, sort of a one node, a three node, and a ten node REAC cluster. Uh, and then finally I'm going to do a very quick introduction to using REAC through the REAC API in Python. But uh, it should expand or uh, it should apply to the other, um, the other cl client APIs that we offer. Okay, so um, there are 47 different NoSQL projects. If you saw uh, Matthias's um, presentation, you'll understand why. Um, uh, the question is, where does React fit into all this? Um, there's a lot of confusion around what all these different things do. So I'm hoping to clear that up a little bit during this talk. There we go. So React is a Dynamo-inspired, open-sourced, key-value data store built to scale predictably and easily. Uh, basically, when the Basho team uh, first set out, well, we didn't actually set out to build React. Uh, when they first set out to build the sales application that they were writing, uh, they looked around for a data store that had a scaling model the way they wanted it to be. In other words, they wanted to be able to uh, have a cluster of machines, have an application running on that cluster, and then be able to stand up a node, run a couple of commands, and have that new machine automatically start taking over uh, some of the... Um, some of the existing data as well as sort of some of the, the new queries and everything and basically distribute the load out to that new machine as well. Um, at the time there was nothing on the market that could do that. So um, the team started building React just as a sort of scratch your own itch type product. Um, luckily in sort of a serendipitous uh, right place right time type of thing the engineers that originally built React and the people we have building it today, a large number of them are from Akamai. So these are people who understood how to build large distributed systems uh, and be aware of fault tolerance and things like network partitions. So all of that is, uh, you know, really resonated. Uh, the Dynamo paper really resonated with the team. Uh, and they, they took all of that into consideration when building React. Um, so that's the real secret of React. Uh, it was built for your operations team. In other words, if we're doing it right, your ops team is going to look like this content dog here. Uh, calm, relaxed, wearing a party hat, slightly stoned. Um, so the next section of this talk, uh, I'm going to go through and describe which characteristics of React become important uh, at different sizes. Don't worry about being late. This is the important part of the talk. So. Oh, sure. Yes, we, we held it up for you. <laughs> All right, so which characteristics of React become important at different cluster sizes? Uh, as I said, I'm going to go through and sort of discuss a single node React, you know, scaled all the way down to one node, as well as a three node uh, React cluster, as well as a 10 plus node React cluster, uh, and talk about which different features become important. One thing I want to stress here is that all of these characteristics are present at all times in a React cluster, and these are all available in the open source model. Um, but different things become important at different times, just like uh, in your car, some things become important at 100 kilometers per hour. Other things become important at 200 kilometers per hour. Uh, other things become much more important when you're going 200 kilometers per hour and you're trying to go to zero miles per hour, kilometers per hour. Sorry, I'm speaking in American. Um, all right, so let's look at a single box of React. Uh, well, the story here is simplicity. Uh, you get a lot of things that you would expect from a simple key value or document-based data store. You get a key value type access patterns, uh, query patterns. You get a flexible schema. Uh, it's just very simple to get up and running. Um, there are clients in Ruby, Python, JavaScript, Java, PHP, and Erlang. Um, and it does scale all the way down uh, in that the developer interface here is exactly equal to your production interface. So you can be working on something that's installed locally uh, and then trust that when you deploy that to a production environment, you're going to get the exact same interface and the exact same behaviors. Um, one thing that becomes important, uh, one other thing already, uh, in a single box of React is that you get something, uh, you get configurable buckets. Uh, and the idea of this is that buckets are sort of the tables of React. Um, 
And when you're developing an application, you know that sort of different data has different characteristics. It's shaped in different ways. Uh, so you might have an application that has, uh, that's storing both profile information for a user uh, as well as MP3s for that user. Um, those are going to be very two very different things. Uh, in other words, the, uh, the profile is generally going to be a lot smaller. Uh, it's going to be accessed a lot more frequently. Uh, and you might want to store more copies of it, both because it's smaller and because you never, ever want to lose your user's profile, because if you do, you've lost a user. Um, on the other hand, you know, consider the MP3. It's going to be much bigger. Uh, you'd like to store multiple replicas, but you're going to have that sort of space cost trade-off in doing that. Um, and you might actually want to store that on the file system in a different way, either on a different storage medium. Uh, you might want to compress it differently. There are a lot of different things you can do. So with React, you can actually configure this by bucket. Um, bless you. Um, you can store, uh, you can have a profile bucket that's configured in one way with a different set of replicas than an MP3 bucket, which might be configured in a different way. Uh, the other thing I want to highlight that's, that's important even on a single box uh, React installation is something called links. And if you saw Matthias's presentation uh, earlier this morning, he touched on this. A link is just a lightweight data relation uh, between two objects. So the idea is that you create two React objects and you have a parent-child relationship from one to the other. And then what you can do is actually, um, at query time, you can pass in a key as well as a set of instructions on how to walk from that key to all of the uh, child relations. Uh, and then all of that walking happens on the server, and then at the end of that, you're given back the set of objects that results. So that lets you do um, some sort of lightweight you know, data relations. It gets you back some of the ground that you might lose by going from a relational database to a, to a NoSQL data store. Uh, you know, relationally speaking. Um, uh, it also lets you do very simple graph operations. You don't want to do, you know, you don't want to do sort of millions and millions of nodes like the, the sort of thing that Neo4j is good at. But if you have something very simple that you want to do that's, that's graph-based, you can do that with React. So now what happens when you take that single node cluster or a single node box of React and you grow that to a small cluster, so three boxes? Um, well, the first nice thing about this is just the way that you grow it. Uh, all you have to do is stand up a new machine, run a couple of commands, uh, and again, as I said, the data and the, the, um, the queries all start to go to that new node as well. So you've distributed your load. The new node takes some of the load off the existing system. Um, all of the other, or many of the other things in this list are all about taking advantage now of that cluster that you have. You want to be able to leverage all of the resources uh, in a parallel way. So you have something uh, called JavaScript-based MapReduce, where what you can actually do is take a set of starting keys, as well as some JavaScript map and reduce functions, and run a map and reduce operation in real time that goes, uh, you know, the, the map operations respect data locality. So those operations are actually run on the nodes where your data lives. Um, and it calculates the value and then returns it to you in real time. So this is something that you can do, uh, you know, it's, it's sort of like a mini Hadoop, and, but instead of running a, a MapReduce job, you run a MapReduce operation, and you get those results back much more quickly in web time. Uh, something else that I'm describing here, because it becomes important in the next couple of bullet points, is pre and post commit hooks. Um, so these are, are, I shudder to say this, I don't know if it's the right term, but they're sort of like the triggers of React, uh, if, you're, if you're familiar with, uh, with uh, SQL triggers or MySQL triggers. Uh, the idea with a pre commit hook uh, is that it's going to run um, uh, basically before any data is written, and it lets you check data integrity uh, and check permissions on that data or sort of anything you would want to do before the data is written uh, and optionally fail out if that data should not be written to the data store. Uh, the converse of that, there are post commit hooks that are going to run after the data is written, and you could think of using something like that for logging or notifications or something else uh, where you can inspect the data that was actually written to the database uh, or the data store and then run some sort of operation on that. Uh, these are sort of very simple primitives and they let you do some complicated things. Yes? Uh, oh, so, so the question is, are the commit hooks only for writing in JavaScript? Oh, okay. So the, uh, the pre-commit hooks now, uh, you can write in both Erlang and JavaScript. Uh, the post commit hooks are only in Erlang right now, which uh, but eventually uh, we're we're getting it to to JavaScript as well, uh, and the reason is just because of some of the communication now in the Erlang JS um, library, which is what we use to to make the two talk. So, in the future, you'll be able to do both. Um, all right. So what else? Well, I described. Uh, 
some of the different libraries that are available on the previous slide. Um, all of those libraries are available and, uh, and use an HTTP interface, which becomes really important uh, for, for when you think of putting React into production or in some sort of application. Uh, since React speaks uh, well-behaved uh, well HTTP, uh, you can treat it like, yes, I'm getting thumbs up from the couch guys, yes. This is very important. You can treat it just like a web server. In other words, you can put a proxy in front of it, or you can put a load balancer in front of it, or, or a cache layer in front of it, and you can think of it just like as it's serving some sort of web resource, uh, and it will behave the way you would expect. A uh, quick example, we actually have a client who is uh, who's doing that, who's put Nginx on top of React, and has uh, locked things down so that um, uh, they are actually serving some of their uh, some of their data directly from React straight out to the client. Um, so you eliminate that middleware, fewer moving parts. Uh, it's a much nicer solution. We have somebody doing the opposite of that as well, uh, where they've actually locked down read operations and are only allowing clients to write because they're actually collecting data and they want to be able to have an always write available way to collect that data. Um, so they're so you know out there in the world, the clients can write directly to React without any sort of middle layer. Um, and finally, uh, protocol buffers. Uh, uh, all of the clients that are, I think most of the clients that I mentioned on the previous slide uh, also have the option of working through pro protocol buffers. Um, so uh, you know, there are some advantages to using HTTP. You can treat it just like a web server, but there are also advantages to protocol buffers, namely speed, which is why we did it. So if you really need to pump data into the system and you don't care about the HTTP sem semantics, you can do that with protocol buffers. All right, so now what happens when you take that three-node React cluster and grow that to 10 nodes or 20 nodes or 30 nodes? Um, this is the slide for your operations people. Uh, basically, all the things on this slide are important for the people who are actually trying to get this thing to run. Um, and what's nice about that is the happier the operations people are, the happier the developers are, the less time everybody needs to spend bickering about things. Uh, it's a good thing. So let's look at what uh, React offers here. Um, Homogenous. Uh, there are no special nodes in React. There are no masters, no slaves, no name nodes. Every single node is the same. And this gives you this great property that if any node should die an unexpected death in the middle of the night, you don't need to care about which one. Um, you can just determine, well, do you have enough other replicas of your data on there uh, for the system to continue serving that data? And if it does, then you can go back to sleep. Uh, and this has actually happened uh, in the early stages of React. Um, uh, the team had, I think, a five-node React cluster. Two of the nodes died, but there were enough replicas where people could go back to sleep because it was the, the middle of the night. Um, whenever available, uh, or when, whenever you can, if that node dies, all you need to do is just stand it back up. Uh, and any data that was supposed to be directed to that node will get handed off appropriately. Uh, through the use of vector clocks, we can determine which version should be right. Um, it just all happens for you automatically. Uh, finally, uh, as I already mentioned, you can scale simply by adding machines. You just stand up a machine, run some commands on the command line, and it just starts taking the load. Um, and finally, uh, something I call self-contained installation. Uh, what this means is that um, you can actually take the source code of React. So we offer binary builds, uh, and you can do this with these as well. But you take the source code of React and you can compile it so that everything you need to run it, including the Erlang uh, virtual machine, is embedded into a single directory. Then you can zip that up and copy it to any other computer of the same architecture and, and unzip it and everything you need will be able to run. So it's a very nice localized way uh, to deploy a React onto a bunch of machines very easily. Now I always hate getting to this slide because it's the money slide. Um, but yes, there are some clients out there that need support and that's what Basho does. We, we both create React and we also, or we, we, we make React, and we also provide uh, support and some enterprise tools around it. Uh, on-call support 24-7, management tools, SNMP monitoring, multi-site re uh, multi replication. There are a few other things. Um, and that's important to some clients to be able to have somebody that uh, if something does go down in the middle of the night and they have questions, they want to be able to call somebody. So that's, that's how we make our money and stay in business and continue to, to work on React. Um, a disclaimer, I'm a big believer in truth in advertising. Uh, you'll actually be talking to John Hornbeck, most likely if you call. Uh, he's our director of support. Um, but but wouldn't it wouldn't it be nice though? I mean, all right, there we go. 
Okay, so that's uh, that's the um, you know scaling Rioc single node, three nodes, cluster. Um, before I start on this next section, any questions about that? Yes. Okay, so the question is, yeah, if, if one node's die, if one node dies and that node was supposed to be one of the was supposed to hold one of the replicas, what happens to that replica, right? Uh, so yes, that replica is uh, is written to some other available node, um, and then when the original node comes back up, that data is is handed off to the original node, uh, and through the use of vector clocks, which I, I won't go into, but on the uh, on the Basho blog, uh, there are some great posts about vector clocks and how they work. Um, it knows when when sort of one data uh, one object is a descendant of the other, uh, or it can also tell if there are conflicts, and then you can choose to either um, uh, handle those automatically through timestamps, or you can bubble those up to the client application or even the client user if you want to. Um, any other questions before I proceed? Yes. Uh, yes, Google's protocol buffers. Uh, oh, that's a question for not me. Um, Yes. Yes. Oh, so, so the question is which which version of protocol buffers? I'm not sure. Um, and then how do we implement it? Yes, we have. Uh, there's an Erlang uh, protocol buffers implementation that we do everything through that. Yeah. All right. Um, all right. Moving on. A uh, quick uh, quick tutorial. I'm just going to check how I'm doing on time here. Okay. <laughs> all right. So about 15 minutes in. Looks like I'll probably finish up just a little early. But a quick tutorial of, of getting Rioc and, and how to use it uh, from an API perspective. So getting Rioc is pretty simple. Um, there are binary builds that you can download from downloads.basho.com slash Uh You can actually get a build for, if you're running uh, OS 10, you can get a build for that and you just unzip and run it. Uh, there's also builds for, uh, for different versions of Linux. No Windows builds, I'm sorry. Um, run a real operating system. Um, to start Rioc, you change the directory that you want to start it in and then run bin Rioc start. Uh, if you just run bin Rioc on its own, there are a bunch of different commands you can use to start it, stop it, join a cluster, leave a cluster, things like that. Okay, so to connect with Python, oh, and the, the Python library is at uh, hg.basho.com. There are a bunch of all the different client libraries are there that you can find. Um, so you uh, import the, uh, the Rioc library. And then to connect, you just create a client object. Uh, so here we're going to say react.react.client, and we're going to pass in the host name uh, as well as an IP address. And this, these examples that I'm all going to show you are all connecting over the HTTP interface. Um, there'd be some flags that you would pass in here to use protocol buffers. All right, so to store data, it's pretty easy. Um, as I said before, React thinks in things in terms of buckets and keys. So we're going to create a bucket. We're just going to call that my bucket, and we'll create the my bucket object. I really need a laser pointer. I'm sorry that this pointing is not really working. Um, next, after you've created the bucket, you're going to create an object. Uh, so we'll create a new object called my object. Uh, then that line there, I wonder if this will work. Hold on. There we go. All right. Um, so in this line here, we're actually setting the data, and here we're setting it um, uh, as just a simple associate of array. Uh, the client libraries know how to transform that into something uh, something appropriate to the library. I think we I think it actually ends up being transformed into JSON and then transformed back. Alternatively, you can tell uh, the client library to treat the uh, whatever data you're passing in as sort of an opaque binary, um, and then you know use whatever sort of serialization that you want. Um, and finally, this line uh, this is where we actually uh, call out to the data store and store the data. So the next thing we're going to do down here is read the object back. So we're going to get the object by passing in the key. So we've got mybucket.get and pass in the key. And then we can print out the data. Uh, alternatively, like I said, this is going to, um, uh, since we speak uh, well-behaved HTTP, you can go straight to uh, mybucket slash myobject and get the, the object back out or the, uh, the contents of the object back out. All right, so the next thing I'm going to describe are links. Uh, here, this is just a simple example of creating uh, a band and then some albums and some band members under the band. Um, 
Oh, and I've lost my mouse here. What the heck? There we go. All right, so here we're going to create buckets for bands, albums, and members. And then we're going to create a new uh, band object called winger, uh, if you remember winger. Um, and then what we're going to do here is add a bunch of links to the winger object. And we're sort of creating these objects in line. So every time you see this albums.new, and that's the name of the album, and that's the album sales that I just made up some numbers, uh, and the store operation. So actually, for each one of these store operations, we're going to be hitting the data store. Um, and then uh, at the end here, after we've defined this object with all the links in it, we'll be hitting the data store again to store these. So we're just creating this structure here. Uh, the, reason, the reason I sort of point out that we're hitting the data store about, about eight times here is that because in, in React, there's no sort of transactional support. It is a, it is a key value store sort of thing. Um, so there's no way to write multiple objects at the same time and sort of guarantee that they've gotten written. It's, uh, it's just, you know, you're, you're doing one at a time here. All right, so now after you have that structure uh, in the data store, you can do some interesting things like this. So first what we're going to do is get a list of all of the albums uh, under, the, uh, under the winger object. So this is the winger object here. We're going to uh, define some instructions to walk to all of the albums. It's going to walk to anything in the albums bucket, and then we're going to run, and we'll get a list of all of the objects that are, or all of the albums that are associated with uh, the band winger. Um, here we're going to do the same thing, but we're going to get the songs out of those albums. This assumes that we've already written songs underneath those albums. And here we're going to do a two-phase uh, walk. So we're going to walk two steps down the links. Um, so we're going to walk first to all the albums, and then all the songs, and then we'll run that and we'll get a list of songs back. Uh, and then finally we're going to get the members, but I'm going to show you this in a slightly different way. Uh, so instead of using a starting object to, to start your link walking, Instead, this is going to use MapReduce. So we're going to create a new MapReduce object here. And we're going to add the starting key of bands winger. And then we're going to do that link walk down to the members. And then we'll run that and we'll get a list of members back. Cool. All right, and that works out. I've got 10 minutes left and this is actually my last slide. So we'll have plenty of time for questions or to, uh, to go stretch your legs and, uh, and do whatever else you have to do. Um, so the last, is, uh, last slide here is MapReduce. Um, the idea here is this is an example to count the number of, of album sales. Uh, so again, we're going to start with that winger object. Uh, we're going to link to all the different albums. And that's, that's going to give us the list of keys that those albums belong to, uh, or sorry, the list of objects that, that, are, that are in that album's, uh, that, that result in that album's uh, link walk. Um, and then here we're going to map that through this JavaScript function, uh, which is just going to extract the data. So it's going to extract the number of, of, al uh, of album sales here. Um, and then, so this is an example of actually passing in an inline JavaScript function. So you can pass in things like this, where you actually pass in the entire function uh, in the operation itself. Um, or what you can do here is you can call uh, JavaScript that's already been predefined and preloaded into the system. So this is using one of the built-in React functions. Um, uh, we're going to call the, the reduce operation using this function. And then we'll run that. Uh, and as a result, we'll get the entire number of album sales for the band Winger, which I'm sure is something you all really, really wanted to know immediately. Um. All right, so that's actually it. Um, uh, that's my talk. Any questions? Yes. Uh, are you talking, uh, is the question about for MapReduce? Uh, so the question is, can you, can you actually use MapReduce sort of in real time for, for sort of web speed type things? Uh, and yes, absolutely. Um, well, so, so the thing is, remember that you're, whenever you're doing a MapReduce operation or a link walking operation, um, you're actually going to start it with a list of starting keys. Uh, so then based on those starting keys, that's where you um, well, I mean, because it's a key value store, it's very quick to get the objects for those keys. Um, there, there is support in React for doing a full uh, uh, table scan, so basically listing all of the keys out. Uh, that's not something you want to do sort of in real time, because that's, you know, how if you have millions of keys, it's going to take millions of instances, or a long time, I'll say. Yeah. Uh, yes?
That's that's interesting. Um, at this point, no, but you you will be able to in the future. Uh, and and the reason I say that is right right now there's no way for for um, actually I take that back. Yes, if you write the last phase in Erlang. So sorry. The the, the question is uh, if you're running some sort of MapReduce operation. Um, can you then store the results of that MapReduce operation back in React and then maybe use that the next time you go around and maybe comb through your data or do some sort of interesting stuff there? Um, if you're writing your MapReduce operation, if the last phase is in Erlang or whatever phase, basically if the phase is in Erlang, um, then yes, you can write it out. You know, you can communicate out from that Erlang MapReduce step back into React and do whatever you want to do. Um, right now, there's no way to sort of talk to the outside world in JavaScript. You just get to return a value. Um, once that's in there, you'll be able to do that, um, and you'll also be able to do the, the post commit hooks in, in JavaScript as well. Uh, so that's a good question. So you're saying the map phase, uh, where are these different phases run? Uh, and yes, the map phase is run uh, respecting data locality. So it runs on the node that contains the data. Uh, the reduce phase at this point, I think, just runs uh, on the sort of the the, the um, instance that s that spawned the operation. But I know we're doing some work to sort of break that up into multiple stages now and and sort of do partial reduces. Yeah. Uh, yes. That's that's a good question. So the question is, how do how do nodes know that they're part of the cluster? How do they discover each other? Um, we we stay pretty true to the Dynamo paper here, and we actually have an explicit uh, join command line operation. So if you run um, if you if you're playing with React and you run bin React admin, uh, there's a join command which will tell React to join some cluster, and there's also a leave command to take it back out. Uh, so. Uh, So how do you how do you specify which node to join in the cluster? Is that? I'm so I'm having trouble. Yeah. How do you specify the cluster? Uh, the cluster, I guess, is uh, is really um, uh, basically it's just all all the nodes that are in the cluster are, are are the cluster. I'm not sure if that's. Oh, how do you how do you join? So what do you actually type on that command line to get it to join? Okay. Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, bin React admin join, and then sorry, and then you and then you also provide um, the the Erlang node name of one of those nodes in the cluster that you want to join. So generally, that's going to be React at some host name. Um, yes. Is it po possible to start large blobs. Uh, uh, yes. Um, depending on your definition of large. Um <laughs> uh so so the original Dynamo paper sort of assumes uh so the question is can you can you store large blobs? Uh the original Dynamo paper sort of assumes that you're gonna be storing things in the you know in the few K to about one meg range. Uh we have tested and have stored things much bigger than that, and when I say much bigger I mean tens of megs. Um I think at this point there's a limit at about sixty-four megs. Um, and we're doing work to be able to break through that limit. Uh, and that's well underway now. Uh, yes? Excellent question. So the, so the question is, when you add a link, is there a way to type that link? Um, uh, or tag it, per se. Um, uh, like, uh, so so, I so if you saw in that example, um, the links, when you add a link, uh, it actually, you add the bucket name. You can also add another parameter that is some tag. And you can add, you know, you can add as many links as you want uh, under, you know, you can have, you know, can add, you know, you can, uh, you can have links that you add for a bucket, and you can have multiple tags there. So you would just add multiple links, and then when you do that link walking phase, um, let's see if I can show you here. Um, uh, here, along with albums, you would provide another parameter that had the tags that you wanted to follow. And both of those are optional. So you can follow, you can sort of limit by one but not the other. You can limit by, you know, bucket but not tag. You can limit by tag but not bucket. Or you could limit by neither and just say follow all the links. How am I doing on time? It's two minutes left, so probably uh, maybe one more, two more questions. How about these two guys here? Yes? I don't know her phone number. I'm sorry. 
<laughs> uh, yes. All right, so the question is what, it, what exactly is multi-site replication and sort of how does, how does it work? So, um, oh my gosh, I've, I've totally killed my slideshow here. Um, don't, there we go. Um, yeah, <laughs> I know how to use computers. Right, so, um, so, there, so there's sort of uh, intra-cluster replication, which is what you get for free with React, which means that you know, when, when, you, when you write something, you make multiple replicas of it, and then if something fails, you can refer to those other replicas, and your data continues to work even when something has failed. Um, uh, Multi-site uh, multi replication means that you are actually replicating from one React cluster, maybe on the, on the East Coast, or you know, say in Berlin, you're replicating from one cluster here to another cluster in some different data center, maybe in Boston. Um, and th and that's th one of the enterprise features, and we wish we could give it away, but we need to charge for something, otherwise we all starve. So, um, and I think you had one one last question. Sorry, this is the last question. I'm happy to answer anything else after um, after we break. Uh, yeah, there's yeah. So the question is, which which headers uh, does HTTP uh, provide? Uh, it yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I'm not the right person to answer that question. Uh, I'm pretty confident, though, that it's that's providing the full set. Uh, and the reason is because uh, a different product that Basho makes is something called Web Machine, uh, which is which is sort of a, a well-known application in Erlang, um, uh, and it's it has the probably the best implementation and the most uh, uncompromisingly strict implementation of HTTP that I've ever seen. Uh, and and we're using that to do all of the HTTP stuff. Yeah, it's it's, it's mind-blowing software. Um, anyway, I think that's it for me as far as time goes. Uh, I'm happy to answer any other questions sort of in between sessions. Uh, and thank you all for coming to this talk. I appreciate your time and your attention.